Destroy All Humans came out in 2005. It garnered a pretty big cult following, but never really got the kind of mainstream success that a lot of franchises from that era did. I mean, that's the same year God of War came out. Destroy All Humans actually got fairly tepid reviews. It got C grades and on average was scored in the 70s. But ask a fan and it is a damn good series that needs to come back. Why? Hi folks, it's Falcon. And today on Game Ranks, we ask the question, why was Destroy All Humans a big deal? Four years prior to Destroy All Humans, Grand Theft Auto 3 came out on the PlayStation 2. It was a game that basically changed what everyone expected from video games because open worlds were suddenly possible. Yes, there were variants of open worlds before Grand Theft Auto 3, but nothing like that game. Over the next few years, that concept developed. We got lots of different ideas to fill up the whole open world. We got more comedy-oriented versions of it, more vehicle-oriented versions of it, just a lot of different ideas. By the mid-2000s, we really started to see ideas that went way above and beyond the formula. Destroy All Humans is one of those games. The premise is that a race of aliens has basically cloned itself to a point where they're facing extinction. They need more variants of DNA, so they come to Earth, kill a bunch of humans, and steal their DNA. It's absurd. It's not a plot where you would go, wow, that's amazing. It's a plot that's a setup for gameplay mechanics. And for this kind of a game, that's all you really need. Because for the time, the gameplay mechanics are extremely inventive. Rather than one big open world, generally Destroy All Humans was split up into levels. However, these levels were quite large and played a lot like an open world. In addition, they were very dense, so you never really felt like you didn't have anything to do. Basically, you had to extract DNA from the regular Joes, and the authorities don't like that. So you end up going up against the police and the army and all that stuff. And you can take their DNA too. It's basically a parody of all the old school 1950s alien invasion films and, well, plays with a lot of those tropes including all of the Cold War stuff, makes fun of the racism and ignorance of the United States at the time. For instance, their map of the world. That's literally the United States at the center with like a bunch of things off to the side, small. And the game seemed to have very dumb humor, but in fact it was pretty smart. Through the lens of a couple of aliens who dealt with like farting cows and stuff, a fairly critical look of the paranoid attitudes in the United States in the 1950s is actually present in the game. These were games that sold a couple hundred thousand copies apiece, but this was back in the era where a game like this would have maybe a couple million dollars spent on it. When the development budget is one maybe two million dollars and the advertising budget is maybe the same, bringing in between 13 and 18 million dollars is, well, quite profitable. That's a pretty good return on investment. It didn't really matter that the games weren't well reviewed. What mattered is that people liked them enough for them to make money when they made one. Now in the corporate world today, that's not how things work. Those numbers are more akin to the indie sphere, but at the time a new successful franchise is obviously important. As new games were released, it got lower and lower scores, but people liked the series. It was always willing to take risks, and though those risks didn't always pay off, it's a series that's a reminder of how games used to be in a lot of cases. As you progress through the game, you got new powers, for instance, telepathy. You could mask yourself as a human using psychokinetic powers, ooh. You could also move objects around with your mind. And while this stuff probably doesn't sound like it's an amazing innovation at this very moment in time, there was really not a lot of games that had done this in such a interesting and kinetic way. There were 2D games for sure, but open world sandbox 3D games that were actually satisfying? Stuff like Destroy All Humans was just not commonplace at the time. But it wasn't just gameplay mechanics that made the game so good, it was also its very, very healthy dose of black humor. The game is called Destroy All Humans, and it leans into that concept from a humor perspective pretty heavily. And it's because of this that the game has a very distinct personality. Yes, they used fairly generic aliens. Yes, the motif is pretty much something we've seen before. And yet, if you see it, like if you see a screenshot of it or a video of it, you know entirely right off the bat that it's Destroy All Humans. And as the originals have shown up on current generation consoles, like if we're gonna be completely honest, these games held up. The controls are a little bit 2005, but they're fun. These games are really fun. 
The short answer for why Destroy All Humans was a big deal was because it was a breath of fresh air. It came during an era where a lot of things were a breath of fresh air, where a lot of ideas in 3D games were just starting to get their footing. Certainly Nintendo blew the lid off those things in 1996 with Mario 64, which is still an incredibly fluid and well-playing game that the newest Mario has a lot in common with, in all honesty. But a lot of developers didn't really attempt to go that far beyond that. We got shooters, we got mascot platformers, and we got RPGs. That was basically 3D games. The point is Destroy All Humans was a game that took a fairly generic concept and through humor and incredibly good gameplay mechanics made something entirely new that hasn't really been reproduced in any form since. It's a game that's very fun and doesn't take itself too seriously in any respect and is more than happy to make fun of itself even. It's also a game that is so very 2005, it just reeks of the era. And that includes the one that was on Xbox 360. It's one of those games that just wasn't able to adapt to the fact that games were becoming more expensive. The expectations out of publishers was that they would spend tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars on a game, and they would get significantly more back in their sales. So these sort of small scale type games don't really exist in the AAA space anymore, or even really the mid-tier corporate world. The closest analog you'd have for something like Destroy All Humans is Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, which is in no way like this game, and technically an indie title. I mean, it's a company, but it's not a company operating within the AAA system by any means. About a year ago, THQ Nordic was talking about possibly reviving the franchise, and there are currently ports out. My hope is that if they do, they follow the kind of principles that created the original series in the first place. It's just a cool gameplay mechanic with a funny black comedy story that makes some commentary on certain things throughout history, and it doesn't try to be an all-consuming thing that takes over your life. It's fun, and ultimately I think that's why it was a big deal, despite maybe not making the biggest monetary impact on the industry. It symbolizes the kind of game people want out of gaming, and unfortunately we don't always get it. Did you play Destroy All Humans? Which one was your favorite? What was your favorite thing to do in them? Leave us a comment, and if you enjoyed this video, please click like. If you're not subscribed, now would be a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week, and the best way to see them first is of course a subscription. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon, you can follow me on Twitter, at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time, right here on GameRanks.